Welcome to the Echo Cast. I am Bond Diesel. This is the place where you tend to hear me speak for 30 minutes or so, uh, sometimes about nothing. But today we have a special guest. We have Mr. Bronson M4 himself. I very much appreciate him being here. How are you doing, sir? Glad to be here. I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm doing well. It's a nice early morning. I've got my coffee. How about you? Nice. I don't drink coffee. Yeah, that's make some hot probably chocolate. a good thing. <laughs> cool. Well, um, as we had kind of discussed uh, a moment ago, we we're just going to jump right into some stuff. Uh, the first thing I was going to talk about was uh, some PvP in the Division 2. Obviously, I think we could probably talk for like six hours if we really <laughs> went into it. Uh, but I have some kind of big topics to hit. And the first thing I was going to ask you about is um, your big uh, post on the forums, on the Division forums, about changes for the Division 1. And I was kind of reading through there and picking through things. I'm kind of curious. Um, obviously, those things apply to the Division 1. Um, and we don't really know enough about the Division 2 to see how those things may apply. But uh, yeah. I figure we can still speculate on it. So um, the first thing I want to ask you is, from a theoretical standpoint, I read through that and I loved basically everything I read. Um, how much of that do you really think that we may get to see before the Division One wrap, wraps up? Honestly, very little, if any sure. at all. Sure. Uh, Division is essentially running on a skeleton crew with uh, the vast majority of personnel theoretically working on Division Two. Sure. So you're going to have a lesser amount of people, lesser amount of time, and uh, it's just less of a priority live game compared to Division 2 at this point. And I'd say that's kind of exemplified by the fact that to do I don't want to call the, the running in place glitch simple because I'm sure it's not, but to make those corrections, they're literally pulling people, which kind of gives you the impression yeah. that there's probably not very many people left on the live team, um, which I mean, I find understandable, but at the same time, you know, um, so one of the things that you mentioned in there um, was the kind of the PVP and the headshot damage modifier. Even as someone who wasn't, um, who wouldn't consider myself a huge PVP player for the division, um, I still think that looking back, one of the biggest changes we saw was that change in the headshot modifier. Um, and I think that's something that with lower time to kill and stuff that we're being that we were under the impression of with Division 2, do you think that's something that's going to be really important to to reward that in Division 2 when it comes to the PvP? I believe it should be. Like, player skill gap should be a thing. You should reward headshots over body shots. Uh, I'm not sure if the developers agree with that or if they're going to go that route or if they're going to continue with Division 1 methodology and try to make it more of an even playing field and try to downplay that skill gap. In Division 1, we see that with uh, the headshot damage. For those that don't know, it's essentially attacks. So if you hit a headshot, mm -hmm. the modifier works that it's 20% less base damage and 20% less headshot damage. Whereas if you do a critical hit, it's a 1.0 multiplier, meaning there's no damage drop-off and there's no crit hit damage drop-off. And one thing I thought was interesting is back when they did that, and, and that was one of the examples of things that the, the lack of, of uh, separation between balancing for PC and console. Um, I, I remember a lot of people saying that this was something that didn't affect console players as much. Um, I, I think anyone who would you know check in and watch one of your streams would maybe disagree. Um, I, I really, if anything, I've argued that it punished the skill gap in the in the console version even more than pc um because it rewarded being able to hit headshots with a controller so much more um and it's something that well that's definitely not my specialty um the people i know who <laughs> were were very um more adept to that kind of stuff it was a real bummer to see that change um big time and and i like for me it, it's a matter of i mean i i kind of proclaim myself as not being a PvP, play, PvP player much in the Division 
Um, but I think sometimes that's mistaken for literally the division is the only game I play where I don't do PVP. <laughs> like right. I, I just I other than survival, I love survival. Um, and that's yeah, a whole survival different is an incredibly probably. balanced game mode. I, it's it's I mean I've said a hundred times it's it's the best PVP in this game. For oh me. yeah, by far, especially um, in the light zone. Yeah. So moving on from that, I I have kind of a, a broad question. We can dig into it, kind of depending on your answer. But when it comes to Division Two, um, we had the Seeker Mine stuff, and was it one point seven? I believe uh, uh, one point six with Air Burst Seeker. Was it okay? Um, and then they patched that out essentially. Um, yeah, they severely nerfed the damage. Oh yeah. Do you? But th- uh, the crowd control effect is still there. Like if you get set on fire with zero sure. percent burn resistance, you're on fire for nine point five <laughs> okay, seconds. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Would you say that in the division two, um, they obviously changed the main stats, um, but skill power still, I believe, is in there, um, or at least it was when we looked at the gear sets. Um, right. the, the gear stats do you think that someone should be able to make a one-shot skill build i'm probably going to be in the minority here but yeah i think they should um, however you really have to go into the math behind it so if you're going to be able to do a one-shot skill like uh bfb in 1.2 and mm-hmm. 1.3 mm-hmm. uh, cluster seekers of 1.5 air burst seeker in 1.6 you need to determine the thresholds for when that's going to one shot. So um, I'll use division one as an example. Let's say you have a tactician build. How many stacks do you need? Do you need to proc talented? Do you need to proc death by proxy? How much damage is that going to output to players? And on the other side of that is what soft and hard counters are there? For example, I believe an overheal should be a hard counter to being one shot. Sure. I believe, um, high stamina and a higher health pool should be a counter to being one shot. All damage resilience, exotic damage resilience should be a hard counter to being one shot. So you essentially just need to do the math to determine what threshold base damage you're going to do and what hard counters there are. And 1.2, 1.3 kind of did that to an extent because they hard capped, well, soft capped BFB damage and proximity damage at 250k. And you could still exceed that with chain reaction or demolition man talents, but it was hard capped. The problem back then was you couldn't really have a lot of EDR. You no pretty much had all sure. damage resilience, and that was restricted to smart cover. Sure, so that's what made those two skills overpowered back then. Yeah, and I'm in. I'm actually while we ba- we both may be in the minority, I actually have been an, uh, a a promoter of. I think if someone's willing, like you said, to do the math to do the calculation, to put in the work that you should be able to make a one-shot skill build. And I know there's people who hate that, um, who think that should be all about gunplay and all that, but if you want, my opinion, is that if you want a game that's all about gunplay, you probably shouldn't be playing a light RPG. Exactly. And I think that gunplay should absolutely be made more important and uh, more skillful in the Division 2, 100%. But I also think that if there's someone who wants to be a essentially a skill glass cannon, I think they should be able to be. Now, if that hopefully that also means that if they poke their head up for a second and someone with you know a, a high damage uh, build hits them in the head two or three times, that if they're down, that's fine with me as well. Um, because there has to be that balance, you know, like you were saying. Um, but then having the hard counters and stuff like that. Um, which I'm curious to things like overheal and stuff. I assume from what we've seen so far may not be a viable option because it may not exist. Um, yeah, at I'm least not, not sure as we will. know it now. I'm not sure how they do the overheal combined with the armor bar. Sure. It, maybe there's an armor overheal, a temporary, you know, boost of armor. I don't know. Well, and that's, that's obviously uh, going to be tough, but I've, I've definitely been a big promoter of the idea that I think it's okay if someone goes all in, on skill power that they should be able to be significantly effective. Um, one thing that I think is going to change with division two was I got to use, um, when I went and played the demo, um, whatever computer they had set up that had the seeker mine, um, the air burst in the new one doesn't seek. Um, 
the, the only their burst one. I guess there's going to be other versions of the Seeker Mind that will uh, use AI to, to find enemies and, and target them. But um, the one I used, you actually um, highlighted an area on the map the way you do a grenade, essentially. Nice. Um, and it sawed it out and then popped up in the air and dropped its payload. Um, but it did it not based on targeting an individual, but targeting an area. And gotcha. the, the reasoning behind that that I was given was the more damage you do, the, the more effective the skill is, they want to make those um, more skillful in the sense of predicting where people are and, and not just having it auto aim, essentially. Right. Which I think is going to be a great change. And it's going to give them that ability to give us. And the reason I asked the question about the one shot builds is I think that we're going to have them. But I don't think they're going to be easy the way. Like in 1.6, you know, you would see <laughs> playing last stand in 1.6 was oh, such yeah. a blast, you know, <laughs> literally, literally, exactly. Because <laughs> you literally would run into to games where there'd be two team, there'd be eight people or 16 people on a map and there'd be 16 airburst seeker mines flying around. Yeah. And it was awful, but it was also the library, kind of or not the library, the uh, sports store was the worst <laughs> for that because seekers were bugged and they yep. could travel through vertical yep. levels. Yep. So yep. you'd be running upstairs and get blown up, like crawl up the fire. wall. Yep. What? <laughs> it, I mean, you know, it's it was it was a frustrating time. Um, but I can't, I can say, you know, maybe I'm looking back with uh, rose uh, tinted glasses or whatever, <laughs> but I, I have to say it, it was a, uh, it was at least fun ish in hindsight at the time I probably wouldn't agree, but, um, <laughs> and then kind of on that same topic, getting away from the skill power idea is that, you know, we, we have these new specializations and stuff with this, you know, 50 cal sniper rifle that everyone is, uh, that, 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 that trigger word for people that people love to hear 50 cal, you know, no one, yeah. no one cares about 308 either or, <laughs> and, you know, the things that are, exactly, no, no one wants to hear like, that, nope, but 50. everyone wants the 50 cal, you know? <laughs> But um, do you, and I, I can guess your answer, but do you think there should be one-shot sniper builds? Yeah, I think it should be restricted to bold actions, and I think you should really have to invest all into firearms. But the same principles for one-shot skill builds would apply to a one-shot bold action marksman rifle. I completely agree, yeah. I mean, if you can hit, a, especially with the new movement mechanics, um you know, the PVE side of the game, um, a, a big thing I'm not sure how many people noticed in the demo um, was that in the current game, you almost like stun lock enemies half the time and you hit them and it staggers it staggers the PVE enemies and you can just melt them, especially with the insane amount of damage we can do with builds right now. Oh, yeah. But in the Division 2 and that little demo we got to play, it was really interesting that um, the, they, they evade your shots a lot more. So even in the PVE game, being able to hit those headshots won't be quite as easy as it is now, just because it seems like they've really changed the way that enemies move. Um, with with it does it again? We played such an early build; it's hard to tell what's going to actually carry over. But True. it definitely just it felt a lot different. Um, it felt more satisfying when you hit shots, though. But but yeah, when it comes to the PVP side of things, I I mean I love the idea. Um, you know, we've I've seen you talk about Dead Eye before. And, um, and it, it, that wasn't a good situation. Uh, obviously it, it, it rewarded, you know, essentially bad aim. But the thing I remember that I liked about that time was that in last stand or even just in PVP in the DZ, that was the time where I was playing a lot. That's back when I used to play with Matt goes buck and stuff like that really often. And what I liked about that time though, was that people moved quote unquote tactically when someone yep. had one of those crazy dead eye builds at the end of a street, people got behind cover mm -hmm. and people moved up. They used grenades to displace that dead eye person. They used, it was so funny that, I mean, I get why people didn't like it and I'm glad it's gone in some ways, maybe most ways, but I've said before that, that was such a peek into probably what the devs kind of originally intended the game oh, to play out like. Um, it was while, such a hard counter to the strafing pandemic. Oh my god! It was and, and it was so and even now I I will say and and, and I assume you've probably dabbled in this, but um, there's there's a few people I've seen um, who 
are able to effectively use like the hunter's faith build right now and stuff that they can be really really damn i mean they can be extremely effective oh yeah um, and especially does, in skirmish oh my god i know which and i and i hate it because you know in the moment i'm like damn it you know why does that stupid build take me down in one or two shots but then from like a meta perspective i love it um i oh, just yeah. jumped back in the skirmish a few weeks ago for the first time in quite a while expecting it to just be teams of four strikers and and you know all mm-hmm. that junk and while that definitely does exist and some of the matches aren't fun at all i would really encourage people to check out skirmish it's um at least on the console i'm on xbox i believe you're on ps4 correct correct um it was one it was really well populated i didn't have to wait long for a game and two um you definitely ran in or at least i definitely ran into some teams of four strikers and it's just obnoxious but i ran into a lot more like mixed there'd be like a striker and a pred mark and a d3 and like a hunter's faith build and it was honestly really fun some of those matches got to be really close and exciting and you know, it goes. It gets down to like each team just needs one kill, and you see everyone being real careful. It, it's it's worth checking out. But the one thing I noticed from that is that those people who are effective with that hunter's faith build um, can be really scary. Um, and it's nice. That's something I I wish we got to see earlier and more often. Definitely. So, one of the things that makes skirmish so fun is just the sheer amounts of build diversity. Sure. So every build has their strengths and their weaknesses. And what makes that fun is you have to develop hard and soft counters to that. Mm-hmm. Let's say someone is a really insanely strong fire crest build. So when he drops that turret, <laughs> you're going to take a lot of damage and sure. you're going to be on fire. So you need to either throw an EMP grenade, use the disruptor sticky, or just move away from that thing. So the three builds I've been using in skirmish are um, like a tactician healer, like a four four eight kind of that's what it would be at least nice. in my um a little bit of damage a little bit of stamina but decent healing with a defib and stuff like that i, I love healing people i that's always something i've enjoyed doing is playing oh, yeah. that role um the second build i use a lot is actually just a straight hexo build with some um uh skull gloves yep. um and then the third build is that firecrest build with an mdr and you can just do some sick damage on people. Oh, yeah, between, um, between like the 15% fire crest and then oh, yeah. the 18% MDR buff. Mm-hmm. It's nasty. Um, and the fun thing about that was I actually really enjoyed that Hexo build is interesting because, you know, people have, you know, figured that gotten in that 6P striker and stuff. So you do see people in there. But I found that that Hexo build that I can get up on people. And if you can get those strikers before they build their stacks, um, you can melt them down. Oh, yeah. and, and you can tell they're not used to it. <laughs> you can tell that it's it's like a foreign thing to them because they're they're you see them start to panic. They're popping those heels. They're they're like oh crap! You know, they don't have their stacks yet because you jumped mm-hmm. on them. So, um, but yeah. So if anyone's listening, check out skirmish again. It, maybe try to take a team in with you because it can be a little rough with a bunch of randoms. But check it out. So the last part of this little piece, um, again, probably one a thing where I can assume I know your answer, but. Um, with the new, with the armor, with the way they're doing, it seems like health and stuff like that in Division 2. Um, a, a big thing I've complained about for a long time um, in Division 1 is the prevalence of so many different ways of burst healing. Um, and I'm just kind of curious in general. It seems like that's not going to be a thing anymore. I'm just kind of curious to your thoughts about that. Yeah, so one of the things that prolonged PvP in the Division is burst healing. And if you look at it, there's just too many ways to burst heal. You have med kits, which heal you for 30% burst healing, mm-hmm. and then up to 100% HP heal over time as long as you don't take damage. You have uh, overheal, you have booster shot, you have defib that all has burst healing and heal over time. You have support station master mod that when blown up <laughs> heals you for 30 Popping that HP. box, baby, yep. Exactly. You have <laughs> combat medic. Like, there's so many ways of burst healing. And it looks like they're moving away from that in uh, division two but what i hope they don't do is remove it entirely Mm -hmm. especially for rpg like healers are such a viable option sure and if you take that away then it's going to turn into something that uh is not division to me and something the the only thing i know is and it's not been confirmed it's only been hinted and um but i think it's fairly easy that to see is um, when I went back through, so when I went to E3, the, the funny thing was is that 
that was a great experience. I was more than honored to be named a quote unquote star player, you know, and all the fun things that have come with that. But you gotta say it in all caps, star player. Yeah, yeah, right. And I, I have to, you know, show everyone the check that Ubisoft wrote me when I showed up. <laughs> um, I don't even, don't even get me started on that shit. But um, the, the, the shittle. Thing- yeah, this, well, it's funny. At one point, someone had uh, one of a lovely member in the community uh, dubbed me a diet skill up. So oh, wow. I um, wanted to start calling myself diet shill up and make a shirt. <laughs> but, um, YouTube channel in the making. <laughs> but one, uh, one thing I found while I was there um, in hindsight was that from a, like a content creation perspective, um, being a star player was awful. Because really? I, I I didn't see anything. I, I oh, you know, yeah. obviously I got the the hands on the game, which was amazing, and I would never complain about that. And we got some panels and stuff like that, and and some face to face time with, um, you know, Spear and some other people, which was really cool. Those guys, you know, from from a work perspective and a personal perspective, you know, I think it's easy to judge people's work, but as people. They were just they were they were really just not nice people. There's cool dudes. Mm-hmm. Um, but one thing that I found so I, when I got back from E3, I just did a deep dive into all those streams they did because I missed everything. You know, we didn't yeah. see any of that stuff. And one of the things with the healing that I found interesting is that they just basically said that the um, oh the the hive is replacing the support station, right? And um, that basically some light insinuations that um you know the mod that we saw of the hive in the demo was this thing where it attacks the weak point um of of an enemy within its radius um i think that the natural assumption is that um i know for a fact that the drone was shown in two different mods in the demo um and i believe the the one mod wasn't it was only in the the E3 floor show. I don't. I never really got a full story here, but long story short, the the drone had the mode where you saw everyone using, where you could use the RB button to target enemies out in the field, and it would go out and shoot them and come back. Right. Um, there was also a drone that was a defensive drone that would just hang near you, and as incoming rounds came in, it actually would shoot the rounds out of the air. Oh, nice. Um, and so, in just in that one example, you saw that um, there's there's two mods, which I'm assume, assuming there's going to be more, but there is a defensive and an offensive. And what I think is, you know, should maybe be speculated or assumed is that maybe there's going to be um, like a like a support mod, and there's going to be like an offensive, defensive, support, maybe a medic mod, and and kind of the the long story short there is that. Um, the hive I assume is going to have some mod where instead of shooting out all these little drones that will attack a, a weak spot, it's going to shoot out a bunch of little drones that will heal um, or recover armor or, or do something like that. So I agree. I, I hope that um, kind of like what we were talking about with the one shot builds and stuff like that, sniper or seekers and stuff. I hope that if you're willing to dive into a healing build or something like that, that you're going to be able to. I wouldn't be surprised Absolutely. if there's going to be a specialization. Yeah, I hope there's further yeah, specializations. Yeah. I, I, I kind of assume, and even to the point where um, that skill where you get to shoot the gas cloud. In the demo, we saw the one that the, the fire gas cloud. But I'm going to guess there's going to be maybe something similar to that that is a healing cloud or, or something like that. Right. Too. The, a big thing that they talked about was how they wanted to you know, obviously this isn't going to be a realistic game. You know, it's not going to be Arma. It's not going to be, you know, and and, and I'm cool with that. I, I play Arma and that's fine for what it is, but that's not an experience everyone wants. No. And, um, but they definitely said that the things that they have, they, they want to be a little more grounded. They don't want a support station with a magic ring around it that just magically heals you. They don't want, you know, the, the, the med kits that just, you know, all these little green dots go around and all of a sudden you're healthy again. Um, so, okay. Well, that's kind of, that's cool. I, I, I agree, but I, I hope that there is some kind of ability to go into a support role like that, especially if these raids and stuff are going to be the quintessential uh, activities that they are, are saying they're going to be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have a really simple question for you. Um, 
do you think that the Division One PvP can be called "quote unquote" competitive? Absolutely not. For multiple reasons. Yeah. Um, at the forefront is just the net code and the servers. Mm-hmm. Like, if it's going to be competitive, they need to upgrade to 60 hertz servers exactly. with a higher tick rate, uh, hosted by a tier one service provider such as Amazon Web Services. The uh, the experience I have gotten with that was, I was a, um, I'm a big Battlefield fan actually. Oh yeah. And um, I played Battlefield 1942 when it came out on my people PC, like, you know, 64 megabyte RAM, <laughs> you know, you know, one of nice. those fun set that was back in the day. But my first big jump into that world was um, 2142, which I still hope and pray that one day they bring that back because mm-hmm. um, that was such a cool concept for a futuristic. It was so ahead of its time. So many ways. Um, but my um kind of with this conversation uh, i played battlefield three and four from launch day which uh did, did you are you aware of probably what i'm gonna get at yeah so the hot mess that when people complain about the net code and stuff in the division i, I think it's fully warranted totally understand i get it i've been playing too but no one knows the pain oh, yeah. of playing with bad net code the way that and Battlefield 3 like and 4 players did. level of desync. It, yeah. was it was insane. Horrendous. At the same time, it was also now it, it didn't it shouldn't have happened again with 4. That's a very that's a statement I want to make really clear right now that they shouldn't have made those same mistakes in 4, but they did and um, what was nice to see, though, is exactly what you're talking about. And um, even now, I still go back and play Battlefield 4 here and there. And those 60 hertz servers are just beautiful. It's it's awesome. And um, I think there's even, I want to say maybe it was only in like beta phase. I don't know if they ever actually used it. But I want to say they had like 120 hertz servers. Um, yeah, I think that was... Uh... They called it something different, but that was like essentially during their PTS yes. they were testing that yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I forget what that. Yeah, you're right. They call it something, but, um, but yeah, no, I. So when it comes to Division One competitive, I've said it basically since the game came out that I, that the Division One PvP is not competitive, and 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 you you will get pushback on that from some people. Oh yeah. And and the thing I've found, and maybe I'm wrong. I'm happy. I'm always happy to admit I'm wrong, but I'll be very stubborn and always thinking I'm right. <laughs> but the people that feel that way, that's fine. But I I don't think you're finding those people playing Counter-Strike. No. You're definitely. not finding those people playing actually competitive games. No. And they don't have a history of playing competitive games either. Or like, if they um, did, they I were wasn't very a PC good at dude. It. Yeah, <laughs> and, like, and that's why pretty I much everyone that argues that division is competitive now, one hundred percent, in my experience, relies on strafing. Yep. And 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 that's a bummer. And and the and the thing that I've said is that I wish it was competitive. I wish it had those features for it to be because there's obviously an audience for it. There's okay. obviously people who want it to be. But the thing I've said about Division One is that. The, the things that make it not competitive are the things that the people who want it to be competitive get mad about the desync, the, the balance issues, all that. But I've, I've kind of told people that if you look at the developers, if you look at the game and if you look at the way the game has changed in, in the two and a half years, whatever it's been out is that it's, I don't think they ever intended for it to be competitive. No. And cause the, the guys who work on this game aren't stupid. They, you know, they they have experience in competitive games. Thylander worked on Battlefield three and four, and so they they know what it would take, but that obviously isn't the goal. And and when people get mad about it, or about the things that make it not competitive, they I, I feel like it's like people getting mad at a rock for not being a good laptop. <laughs> and 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 I just feel like you know sometimes people are expecting something out of a thing. That it was never meant to be. Um, and, and I'm not saying that's an excuse. My biggest thing is that I think that the PvP in this game should be fun. It should be oh, more absolutely. fun than it currently is. It should be more satisfying than it currently is. Yep. But I just don't 
think that it's especially division one I still think it's ever meant to be competitive, and I think people are trying to make it something it wasn't meant to be. Um, and and I think modes like skirmish and stuff were opportunities to to get it there to give us that outlet. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think they are. I think there's no. you know multiple issues that prevent that. Some of the same issues as like the DZ, and then you know just some issues specifically with skirmish. Um, that said. Do you think there's any chance that the Division 2 will move towards a more competitive PvP? I think for certain modes it could, like if they do survival again, or if they do, uh, everyone's jumping on the Battle Royale band. <laughs> but if they do something like that, then I could absolutely see it. But as sure. far as like the Dark Zone, no. To me, the Dark Zone has always been more of like a MOBA, a massive online battle arena, like okay. League of Legends or Dota. Sure. And, um, you can get competitive in the sense that you can fight multiple teams as one team, but that's not something that's ever going to be tracked or anything like that, unfortunately. Sure. The thing that I'm interested in is, uh, well, a few things. So the, you mentioned the survival. Um, I've, I've said for a long time that I think survival is a better BR than any of the BRs. Oh yeah, and, and the it's, only thing that detracts from it is like it's a two-hour time sink, yep. and uh, there's only twenty-four people in a server, yep. and you don't ever find that many people in it anymore, unfortunately. And even with, if with a full server, you could very well go a whole match without seeing someone. In oh yeah, especially if you didn't want to see anyone. Yeah, and and so with survival, you know, obviously the the low population. Um, you know, of actual players and just in general the 24 player limit on a relatively large map um the the long time sink i agree is something that will will we'll need to change that basically my thought on survival in division two which they've essentially confirmed in some capacity yeah um shorter time more people and or a smaller area um and I and I really think that survival could do well to to take some BR elements, but they really can't bastardize it and make it just no. a straight BR. That would be that'd be a shame, in yeah, my it opinion. It would it, basically devalue the game. Hundred percent. And I I really think that I I I think that you know like the weather mechanic is probably going to go away. I I don't think that's going to be the driving force to move forward in Division Two. Yeah. whatever they're going to do which is fine and i think that's an opportunity where they can bring in a br element that they can they can borrow one thing i'll say is uh, i i played fortnite for a minute I, I respect the hell out of that game it's just not my style yeah um, it's very different compared to its vanilla launch to what yeah. it is now it's it's especially I, like the team play aspect oh like yeah they took away friendly fire and to me that basically just killed agreed team play for me um i i actually like PUBG. i i'm just not very good at it i I, I play on the Xbox and PC, so I, I played those nice. games on PC primarily. And um, a game I started playing last week, um, I had a $20 Steam credit and bought uh, the Islands of Nine. And, oh, yeah, I've been watching my buddy Beer play that. Uh, that game, I actually don't like the aesthetic of it that much. It's a little too <laughs> fantastical for me. But yeah. you've got the games are like 15 minutes long, and they're action-packed. Mm -hmm. And they're fun. That is a fun ass game because it's sad. Now I don't really want whatever survival is going to be the PVP survival. And I really hope that there's only a PVP survival. Yeah. Uh, I know my PVE friends will be mad at me, but there's no reason for it not to just be PVP. It's, but, but that islands of nine does such a good job with making, well, one, the opening, uh, the waiting room is a freaking gun game. And that's a nice. free, that's a that, that's half the fun of playing the damn game is <laughs> is the pre match, but then not the only actual, that, but it gets you into the mentality of all right, I'm about to enter. Yep, it's this no holds barred arena. Let's it's get it's ready. not a bunch of people crawling around on the ground saying that they're snakes. Yeah, uh, you know. So, um, so yeah, no, I agree. In Division Two, I really hope whatever survival comes out as that to me, I hope is really the premier PvP, um, or. And they haven't talked about this at all. I really hope that in Division Two they take skirmish and make it real. 
Yeah. I, I really hope, you know, th- there's a few things I've said are, are essential, like private matchmaking with no rewards would be so huge. Even oh, right now, so. even skirmish in the sense that it's in, if they had private matchmaking, which I understand is not a simple thing to do, that's it's a big sink in the resources. But if they even today, if skirmish was exactly the way it is, whether it's good and bad, if they had private matchmaking for that, there'd be tournaments every weekend. Oh yeah, every single weekend there'd be tournaments that people would play and promote the game and bring their teams in and talk shit and win money and it'd be. I mean, I remember back, I watched back when Sank tried to do that tournament oh, yeah, in the DZ. Too. And, you know, that had, you know, the issues, unfortunately, that it had. But that was such a great idea. And, again, that was kind of a trying to make a rock into a laptop situation, in my exactly. opinion. But it was noble. And and it was something it was that, obviously, effort. the community wanted. Yeah. Um, and then I really, that, in, in some kind of skirmish-ish mode, in Division Two, having that private matchmaking ability, plus a bunch of other things to make it better, um, would be so important to me. Um, what What do you think? And and I don't expect you to go all the way in, but with the DZ in Division Two, what do you think the DZ should be? I personally have always seen the the DZ, and it's not this in Division One. It's the everyone's bored, let's kill each other zone, yeah. which is fine. Um, that's just the way it is. No one needs gear anymore. Half the people don't even pick up gear when they kill each other. Yeah. You know, it, it just that's fine. That that kind of is what it is. I don't see that changing. Um, but in Division Two, I would really like to see the DZ not be the premier place for PvP. I'd like it to be a skirmish mode or survival or, or whatever. But I would really like it to still have that element plus a lot of other stuff. Open world events. You know, stuff like like it is in Destiny 2. I've played very little of that, but that is a feature of that I really enjoy. But what's kind of your vision of what the DZ should be in Division 2 when it comes to PvP or, or just kind of in general? I think it should be the premier PvEVP area. So just like you said, I think there should be more activities. Like Division 1, you have supply drops, you have landmarks, and you have contaminated yep. areas. Yep. Um, I think Division 2 should expound on that by a lot. Like you said, Destiny, uh, I have my own issues with Destiny and Destiny <laughs> sure. 2. But um, one thing they do right are public events. And uh, I also think they should take a page out of Fallout and uh, Skyrim and in the light zone and the dark zone. You should basically have events mm-hmm. that are scripted. And you could have anything from like a faction fight and you could hang back or you could just run up in the middle of it and destroy it there could be like a civilian that needs help and then i also think that there should be like um i don't want to call them raids but i guess strikes that require players in the dark zone to link up join forces and work together towards a common goal okay and then um as far as pvp goes there needs to be a purpose for it when the dark zone first dropped for division one uh, people had no idea what they were doing. <laughs> sure. but, uh, I raised my hand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there was a measurable goal. Like uh, back in 1.0, we had blueprints that were gated oh, behind yeah. DZ rank. Yep. And uh, back then, going rogue was such a monumental decision because when you died rogue, you lost entire levels. Oh, yeah. It's extremely punishing. And... Uh, even if you died non-rogue, you'd be losing DZ experience. <laughs> you lost a ton. Oh, yeah. keys. So it was a very difficult grind, but it was incredibly rewarding. Yeah, I'd really like to to bring back that element. The The funny thing was, is when Rogue 2.0 got introduced and when it was being talked about before it was introduced, there was all the good lord. There was so much shit posting, like just... Oh yeah. People fucking hated each other <laughs> like over that. And and I am one that will admit that in hindsight, um, I think getting rid of um I I think the flagging thing was I don't want to call it a mistake. I, I get why the rogue flag is in there now, why you have to do that. Um my my argument back then was that in the DZ 
again, because there's no goal. I like the idea of the manhunt station because it was a goal. You got your manhunt, and then there was a th- there was a task to complete. I don't right. really care for the implementation of it. I think that you know the the manhunt station should be hidden. I think there should be multiple ones. I you know I think there's a lot that could have been maybe done better with that. Um, but I actually miss that that tension. Oh, of, absolutely. Is that even I? Good lord, that's the only way I got rogue kills was by surprising people who were in their menu, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and it's, and that's gone. And, and, and that's something, my biggest issue was in hindsight, what I would have liked to have seen was for actually the opposite of what we got, not to take away friendly fire from non rogues, um, hunting rogues. But my solution in hindsight would have been to give everyone friendly fire. Yeah. People within rogue groups that, make them because what I think is so funny from my view of it was that I think half the reason that people were so upset about Rogue 2.0 was not that it didn't even things out. It, 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 it swung, I would argue, that before Rogue 2.0, the advantage was to the rogues in a lot of ways. I'd agree with that. With, with body blocking or just accidental friendly fire. Because what I saw happen and what I hated about pre-Rogue 2.0 was that there would be four rogues in a group fighting and you'd start to get these randoms rolling in. They see that icon, they see it pop up on their screen, people start running in. And what would happen is you could have a body blocker who's working with those guys, which was super annoying. But more often is what I found was you'd have, you know, five or six or seven people fighting this group of four and then that one idiot strays in front of you. Yep. And and then you pop off road because you hit them with three shots on accident. So the group mentality goes from, you know, it should be, ah, uh, he he didn't mean to do that. He's got a 19 second timer. We should keep shooting these roads. Yeah. <laughs> but what it turned into <laughs> was 10 people all rogue, <laughs> just all shooting night. And, you know, just this hot mess. And, and it, it just, it was awful. Um, and and that's and that's kind of you know the the friendly fire the the you know the accidental the body blocking was something I'm glad that they handled. The problem is that it sure. did, it swung everything completely in the wrong direction. Yeah, um, uh, one point eight is in Rogue two point oh. It's essentially faction based PvP. Sure, but it's a team of four versus however many from decide to jump team in. Team of four <laughs> to twenty. Exactly. Sure. sure. Yeah, that I'll, I'm curious. I mean, obviously, we have zero information about the DZ at this point, so I won't go too deep into it. But but that's the thing. I, I really I I want the DZ to be a satisfying experience, but for like 15 reasons and not for much fewer reasons. Like I think exactly. it is now. So that was part one of my talk with Bronson. We went much longer than I expected, so I'm cutting it off about halfway through. And uh, next week I will post the second half. Uh, to wrap up this podcast, um, I was going to go over um, some content updates. Um, the giveaway for the E3 exclusive Division 2 art print is still going. Check out the Gleam uh, link uh, in the description or on my Twitter. I've been trying to post it fairly often. Um, like I said before, the Discord is back. Uh, look for a link for that as well. Um, you can check that out on my Twitter as well. I'm at Bond Diesel. Uh, I implemented a green screen on stream uh, for the first time on Thursday, and it was a ton of fun. So expect to see that continuing. I'm going to try to upgrade the lighting a bit, but uh, that should be a new feature. Uh, For a quick State of the Game recap, they announced three new pieces of media for Division 2 that will all be coming out, I believe, in March of next year, the same time as the game. Um, A a new novel by Alex Irvine, who did the New York Collapse book. Uh, This time, according to the Comic-Con panel, it's going to be actually a, a traditional novel, not the journal type book that the first one was. Uh, that's kind of a bummer, but it's going to allow probably a lot more storytelling um, and just a more traditional uh, telling of what was going on. It's supposed to follow April after the events of the first book uh, and supposedly uh, traveling inward into the country. Uh, and there's hints that maybe Chicago, where she ends up. The second piece is going to be a 200 page art book with lore. From the Division 1 and 2. It's going to be a hardcover. Um, it looks like it's going to be akin to the art book for the first game. 
uh, but uh, significantly larger. So that's going to be really, really cool for lore and just for uh, memorabilia reasons. Uh, the third project being a comic book series following um, the events uh, between the first game and the second game. Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to show you know, the agents going to DC or what happened in Division 1 after the game ended. Uh, maybe it'll wrap up the Division 1 story in New York. Uh, we will have to wait and see. They announced that there were four times more people signed up for the Division 2 beta than any game ever before for Ubisoft, uh, which the previous record holder was the first division. Uh, so back in 2015 when, the, when they did the, uh, the beta signups. They talked about Comic-Con. Um, Julian, Alex Irvine, and a couple of the narrative people were going to be at the Comic-Con in San Diego doing a talk about Division 2 lore, writing the story, uh, the new book, stuff like that. Um, so far, there's no VOD of this. Uh, there may be one posted. It seems like the, the PR people and Julian want it, um, but there may be some some uh, some hurdles there. So for now, um, if you check out Deep Fried Dave's Twitter, um, he posted a account that has uh, like an eight and a six minute video that was taken during the panel. Um, it doesn't give a ton of information, but um, it is worth checking out at least if you want to get a bit of a preview. Um, hopefully, at the very least, we get some kind of article written about the panel um, that gives us some of the answers and some of the uh, the information given out. Uh, the On the state of the game, they talked about bugs and rebalancing, the running in place bug that Marco had talked about a while ago and put out a video on uh, just a few days ago. Um, they are going to work on it and fix it. They're taking devs from the Division 2 development and putting it back on the Division 1 live team uh, so they can get that knocked out. They're also going to look at striker rebalancing, and they said that if there's any other bugs or significant issues that people want to be addressed, this is uh, this is the time to do it. And my personal opinion is it's probably the last go that we're going to have of any significant fixes for Division One. So contact Amper, contact uh, the guys uh, Yannick, Hamish, and Petter. Uh, go to the forums. Be heard now because it may be uh, one of the last times that they're able to really invest into this. Uh, there's a new shield that's been released. It's sacred. It all takes place in the underground. I think it's reaching level 10, killing 10 hunters, and doing 10 phases. It's, you can knock it out in the day. Uh, probably four or five phases, uh, four or five runs of three phases. You should be fine. And if you don't have the underground or the season pass, it uh, underground will be free for the next week. So make sure to get on there and check it out. The last thing was the global event assault will come sometime in July. I suspect there's some reason that they can't disclose the exact date, uh, but they pretty heavily hinted that it won't be this following week. So I suspect that uh, Global Event Assault will begin on the 30th or 31st of July. So that's all I have. Quick little extra wrap up here. I'll post the second part of my talk with Bronson next week in the 18th episode of uh, the EchoCast. And uh, until then, I will see you later.